For five long years, I trusted my wife, believing that our marriage was solid and our future bright. However, everything came crashing down when I discovered she had been cheating on me for several months. I didn't just hear rumors. I caught her on camera engaging with someone else. It felt like a betrayal that cut deep. With a mix of anger and sadness, I decided to serve her divorce papers, and though it may sound cold, I handed them over as an anniversary gift. It was my way of putting closure on a chapter that had turned sour. As I sit at my desk at work, I can't shake off the immense frustration I feel, especially because I haven't been able to see my son much this year. The virus has kept us apart, and I missed out on having him over the summer, which adds another layer to my anger. I only found out about my wife's infidelity at the end of September, and since then, I've been consumed with gathering evidence and figuring out what to do next. The process has been overwhelming, like opening a can of worms that never seems to end. I've had to share my home with someone who has betrayed me and act as if everything is normal. Pretending is exhausting. Every moment with her feels like a lie, and I'm filled with the urge to confront her, to kick her out, to end this nightmare once and for all. My lawyer keeps telling me to hold off, but my patience is wearing thin. It's been nearly two months since I slept in my own bed. The thought of burning that bed when she's finally gone has crossed my mind. I need to rid myself of everything that reminds me of her. The lack of intimacy has led her to accuse me of cheating, which is laughable given the circumstances. When she tries to hug or kiss me, my body reacts with disgust. I feel like I'm suffocating, I see her as something repulsive, and the more I see her, the more I want her out of my life. I feel trapped in a room with her. It's just the two of us with a single table between us, and her constant tapping on that table makes my anger bubble. Right now, I can't talk to anyone about what's happening. The timing isn't right, and I feel like I've let myself down by allowing this situation to unfold. I just want it to be over, and I genuinely miss my son. In a moment of relief, I had a video call with my son earlier, which brought some light into my dark days. During the call, my ex-girlfriend stepped in and made a comment about how I looked terrible. I confided in her about my struggles, missing my son and feeling isolated. To my surprise, she invited me to come visit for Thanksgiving, which lifted my spirits considerably. Although I know there will be some discomfort over explaining why I won't go to her parents' house, I'm looking forward to the trip. I plan to leave at 3 a.m., and just the thought of being away from my wife for four days brings me some peace. After a long drive of about 19 hours, I finally arrived at my ex-girlfriend's house late at night. When I called her to let her know I was there, her husband welcomed me in. He didn't look so well. He had lost quite a bit of weight. We sat at the kitchen table where he pointed out that I looked rough too, and my ex-girlfriend pushed me to share my story. I opened up completely and found myself shedding tears. Tears, I hadn't cried in 11 years since my mother passed away. This emotional release felt cathartic. It was nice to talk to someone who wasn't going to charge me a fortune by the hour. We discussed life and how they were doing amidst their own struggles. They offered me a place to stay, and the next morning, I was woken up by their young daughter trying to play with me. When my son woke up, his joyful shout of, Dad! followed by a big hug filled me with warmth. This surprise reunion was something I desperately needed, especially after not being able to embrace him since April. Now, I find myself feeling more hopeful, even though I know this feeling won't last forever. I need to call my in-laws soon to explain why I can't join them for Thanksgiving. They are decent people, and I feel guilty for not sharing what's really going on in my life. In the midst of all this turmoil, I've also been keeping an eye on my wife's activities to gather information. Her browsing history shows she hasn't even visited certain sites in months, which, at this point, hardly matters. I'm in survival mode and pushing through. I returned home late Sunday after the long drive, exhausted and not wanting to engage with her. I found comfort in my chair, where I slept for the first time in weeks. Although I look and feel terrible, I finally managed to get eight straight hours of sleep, which felt like a small victory in this chaotic period. I had just come home on a Monday after a long day. My wife tried to start a conversation about our relationship, but I found myself feeling completely uninterested in her. It's not that I couldn't perform physically, rather, I was having a moment where my mind and heart were completely aligned in opposing what was happening between us. This realization upset her deeply, 
and our discussion quickly escalated into a heated argument. I mentioned that there might be something wrong with me. After all, I was turning 50, and sometimes these things happen. Instead of understanding, she began to accuse me of cheating on her. She felt I wasn't being a good husband because I hadn't been intimate with her in over two months and hadn't expressed love in the same time frame. She insinuated that my lack of affection meant I was up to something behind her back. I sensed that she was trying to turn the situation around, making me feel guilty about something I didn't do. In reality, I had my own struggles. On September 25th, while working in collision repair, specifically on cars that were in terrible shape, I had a serious accident. I cut my leg quite badly while working on a truck, which led to a trip to the emergency room. They ended up giving me 5 stitches inside my leg and 34 on the outside. It was a painful experience, and I was prescribed strong painkillers. Given my condition, I couldn't drive home, so I tried calling my wife for help. Despite multiple attempts and texts, she didn't respond at all. After about an hour and a half of trying to reach her, I decided to get an Uber to take me home. As we turned onto my street, I saw her standing in the doorway of our house, kissing the general manager from her workplace. It was shocking. They were not just sharing a brief kiss, but looked completely wrapped up in each other. This was supposed to be her working hours. I was in disbelief, so I took some pictures and instructed the driver to keep going. I spent the next four hours at work in the break room, my heart feeling numb and broken. When I finally drove home, my leg was throbbing and the emotional pain added to my physical discomfort. When I arrived home, she wasn't there, but she came back a few hours later, acting concerned. I asked about her day, and her response was filled with what I could tell was fabricated excuses about work. A week later, I discovered she hadn't worked on a Friday for three years, which made it clear that she had been lying. At that point, I turned to Reddit, looking for guidance on how to cope with the situation of infidelity. I stumbled upon various resources that discuss signs of cheating, and I quickly recognized many of those signs in her behavior. She was constantly on her phone and texting, yet she ignored my calls and messages. When I confronted her about my experience in the emergency room, how I tried to reach her without any response, she became angry and insisted that I needed to be a better husband. I showed her the unmatched texts, and for the first time, she looked ashamed. However, she left the house for a couple of hours and later returned, giving me an excuse about having a tough day. The truth was, she hadn't seen my messages because she was preoccupied with an affair. In the time that followed, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong, so I began to investigate. I went through her phone, her laptop, and even her iPad, discovering that I could access everything from her old devices. I set up cameras in our home and began watching her cheat on me in real time for two months. I had always thought poorly of Apple products, considering them overrated, but now it seemed like cheaters should avoid them altogether because Apple sinks everything. Apple has become a central figure in this situation, revealing that she not only dislikes my son, but seems to harbor a deep-rooted hatred for him. This animosity likely stems from the fact that his presence at our home during the summer has disrupted her lifestyle. Over time, I have discovered that this affair has been ongoing for several years, and my suspicions were confirmed when I learned that it is not just her boss she has betrayed me with. One of the men involved is someone I have known and trusted as a friend for over 14 years. This man works closely with her, and his wife has actively helped her conceal the affair with her boss. They even played a significant role in my life. They introduced me to her, attended my proposal, and were present at the wedding. Knowing that I was marrying a woman who was already cheating on me is a painful betrayal I cannot shake off. I have come to realize that there are at least four different men involved in this affair. Two of these men I know personally, while the other two remain a mystery to me. They have taken advantage of my home, engaging in their activities on my bed, my couch, and even on the kitchen table where I eat. The thought of them using my soap to wash themselves is infuriating and disgusting. I try to escape this tumultuous situation by going to my property to hunt deer, seeking solitude for just one weekend. I always invite her to join me, but she consistently refuses. Upon returning home, I am faced with the disturbing truth that a parade of men has cycled through my house, engaging with my wife without any regard for the sanctity of our marriage. I am appalled to learn 
that she did not even bother to clean herself between encounters. It feels degrading to know I have a camera in the bathroom, capturing the betrayal. Things became even clearer when I visited Chicago for Thanksgiving, during which she spent the entire weekend with other men in my bed. For two months, I kept this information bottled up inside me until I confided in my ex-girlfriend. While I maintain an outwardly calm demeanor, I am filled with rage just beneath the surface. There was a moment when I considered confronting her about her infidelity, but instead, I swallowed the lies she fed me. I even went so far as to apologize for our arguments, saying I would seek medical help for my erectile dysfunction. However, reading her text to her boss, where she insulted me, calling me a limp, and expressing her anticipation for Friday, shattered whatever little faith I had left in her. This is not the woman I fell in love with seven years ago. I sometimes want to label her as pure evil, but I suspect she may be dealing with severe mental health issues, perhaps even sociopathy. I never expected this kind of betrayal. After my first divorce, it was challenging for me to even consider asking her to marry me. The scars from that first marriage made it hard to trust anyone. I have pushed away two amazing women because I was still grappling with the pain and confusion from my past. My first wife abused me emotionally and financially, leaving me with just $43, no home, no car, and no way to support my family. For three years, I struggled to find a stable place to live, couch surfing while paying off debts and alimony. At the age of 22, my life felt entirely ruined before it had even truly begun. I vividly remember spending my 24th birthday on a friend's couch, drunk and contemplating a dark decision. I felt trapped in darkness with no hope in sight. Since that time, I have kept that $43 as a reminder of my lowest point. I am not claiming I am back in that place now, but I feel emotionally drained, just as I did back then. I have become wiser and more careful this time around, but when I first caught her in the act, it was a gut-wrenching experience. Coming home early from a trip revealed her unfaithfulness in all its rawness. The extent of her gaslighting was shocking. She tried to minimize the situation, claiming it was not what it seemed and even went so far as to scream at me during an altercation with my brother and his friend. The pain caused by this betrayal, especially considering everything I had gone through in my previous divorce, has left me feeling defeated. The therapy I underwent to heal from my first marriage seems wasted now, as this slow torture of deceit unfolds before me. I feel trapped in a cycle of constant lies. Even when she could be honest, she chooses to deceive. Each day feels like a countdown to another betrayal, and I have long since stopped loving her. I want to be clear, there is no coming back from this. I have mentally checked out. Our anniversary, which now feels like a day of infamy, mirrors Pearl Harbor in its significance. I plan to ensure she remembers it, but the second I feel like it might actually be our anniversary, I am already exhausted. I have a relentless headache that won't go away. Despite the therapy I have gone through, it feels as if it has all unraveled. In a recent development, I had her served with divorce papers yesterday. Some have questioned what my next steps are, but the answer is clear, I will not continue to live a lie. I was not in the right frame of mind to write about everything that happened yesterday, and I'm still feeling a bit off, but I need to let it all out. I woke up, feeling the weight of what I had to do, and left the house in search of some breakfast. I just needed to fill the time until she left for work. After eating, I rented a truck to prepare for what was to come. When I got back home, I changed the locks on the door. My friend and her husband came over to help. He brought along a friend, and together we started packing up her things. We loaded up the bedroom furniture that I had given her as a wedding gift, along with my couch and dining table. It felt surreal to be taking away the furniture that she had defiled. Once we had everything packed, we took it to storage. I put all her clothes into garbage bags. At one point, I was going to throw in her dirty clothes with the clean ones, but my friend stopped me from doing that. By the time we finished, it was past 11 a.m. Once we wrapped up, I decided to buy flowers and chocolates. I went to her workplace to surprise her. When I arrived, I handed her the flowers and candy, and I gave her a big hug and a kiss. She lit up with a smile and a blush, and her co-workers started making gestures, saying, That's so sweet. I told her I'd love to take her to lunch, but I needed to get a checkup on my leg. I reminded her not to make any plans for the night, 
as I wanted to create a memorable evening for her. After saying goodbye with a kiss, I turned to leave. From that moment on, I decided to start referring to her boss as GMFING Tom. As I walked out, I spotted her boss and gave him a bright smile saying, Hey, FING Tom, how are you? I waved and left the building. Afterward, I went to grab some lunch. Little did I know that at 2 p.m., a deputy was about to walk into my wife's workplace to serve her with papers. I stood outside FD's house, feeling a mix of emotions. I sent a picture to my friend of the day I caught them together, a selfie in front of his house. When I knocked on the door, Mrs. FT answered. I knew her a bit from parties and events related to my wife's job. I told her straight that my wife and her husband were having an affair. She didn't believe me at first, so I showed her the initial picture I had taken, and then I revealed a more shocking photo, a selfie that showed them together while my wife was engaging in something inappropriate on our couch. She slapped me hard, and I just stood there in shock. Then, she broke down in tears. I handed her a thumb drive containing everything I had gathered about the affair and warned her to get checked for STDs. I also gave her my lawyer's card and my number. She then asked why I was doing this to her, and I found myself struggling for words. I felt terrible for causing her pain, but I insisted she had a right to know the truth. Even though I felt like a fool for saying it, I believed it was important. As I left her house, my phone started blowing up with messages and calls. I ignored them and made my way home. Once I got home, I changed my Facebook status to divorced. I began to read the frantic texts from my wife, filled with confusion and anger about what I had done. I replied and told her she could come to the house at 7 p.m. to collect her belongings, but not a minute sooner. It became clear that if T hadn't informed her about what I had done right away, I figured he had his own issues to deal with. A little later, I received a call from my friend, who had been covering for my wife, whom I'll refer to as Amber. I answered, asking her how long she had known about the affair between my wife and FT. I wanted the truth. She finally admitted that she had known for a long time, even before I met my wife. It was shocking to realize I had been the side piece in what I thought was my marriage. That was an incredibly bitter pill to swallow. I asked her why she had kept it quiet all this time. She said she was worried I might react violently. I told her she knew me better than that. Her loyalty to my wife was evident, but I confronted her about the friendship. I wondered if the roles were reversed, and it was her husband cheating, wouldn't she want to know? She agreed but still justified not telling me. I ended the conversation and sent her pictures of my wife and her husband together and shared my lawyer's number, telling her he had all the information I knew. I concluded by telling her never to contact me again. At around 4 p.m., I made it clear to her that I wanted no further contact, asking her never to reach out to me again. Shortly after, my wife arrived at the house and discovered that I had changed the locks. She began banging on the door, shouting for me to let her in. I chose not to respond. When her phone calls came in, I turned off the ringer, hoping to avoid any further confrontation. In a fit of frustration, she broke one of the windows and left the premises close to 7 p.m. Moments later, two deputies parked outside my house. One of the officers was a fellow who had helped me with moving my belongings earlier. His wife appeared soon after, along with my friend. By 7 p.m., my wife returned, looking considerably more subdued than before. I had a feeling that she and Amber had already gotten into an argument by that point. I handed her a bag containing her clothes, the storage key, and the address for the storage unit, along with my lawyer's contact information. I informed her that any further communication should go through my lawyer. She started expressing feelings of love, saying things like we could make it work, she was sorry, and she loved me. She insisted that her actions were a mistake, and that she didn't really love anyone else. In response to her pleas, I simply pointed to my lawyer's card. She countered by claiming that it was her house too, and that I had no right to kick her out. I asserted that it was my home, emphasizing that she had essentially ejected herself from it. At this point, her demeanor shifted dramatically. The affectionate words quickly transformed into angry shouts filled with profanity and hatred. The deputies turned on their lights as more neighbors came out to witness the escalating situation. I maintained my composure with my hands at my sides while she continued her tirade. 
I suspected she might have been drinking, as she began to cry, claiming she had nowhere to go. When I told her that I didn't care, I discovered an unsettling truth about her. She had a surprising amount of strength and threw a punch that left me with a swollen lip and a bloody nose. Despite the pain, I stood still, allowing her to hit me. She attempted to scratch my face, but the deputies stepped in and restrained her. I chose not to press charges. Instead, I asked them to just make her leave. They proceeded to file an incident report so I could seek a temporary restraining order later on. Strangely enough, I felt some relief knowing that she had left. Once I was back inside, cleaning myself up, a wave of emotions hit me, emotions I had kept bottled up for the past two months. I felt utterly exhausted and, contrary to my expectations, I didn't feel any better after everything that had happened. Instead, I felt terrible. Though I usually keep my emotions in check, I found myself crying frequently since the previous night. My phone showed nearly 600 unanswered texts and calls, a number that kept rising. I decided to cut off contact with our mutual friends, not wanting any of them to intervene in this situation. I put aside the thought of calling my son that night, something I had done every night without fail. I planned to explain everything to him the next evening. I didn't think he'd be too upset. He had never been particularly fond of her. An update on the situation. I met with her and her lawyer the following day. Although I didn't get every detail I had hoped for, we made enough headway to sign the papers for an uncontested divorce. It should be official in about two months. While there is some relief that comes with this news, I also feel an overwhelming sadness about the entire situation. Throughout the meeting, she barely made eye contact with me, and I couldn't help but wonder what was going on in her mind. It felt as if she didn't have the courage to look me in the eye. Her lawyer seemed competent enough, although he was clearly dealing with a difficult case. During the discussion, they asked if reconciliation was a possibility, and although we toyed with the idea, it felt utterly unrealistic. We insisted on full disclosure regarding her actions. Her lawyer had already asked her to write down what she had done, but the details she provided were incomplete and conveniently left out the identities of two other men I didn't know about. My lawyer then showed them still images from the camera footage and asked about the men in the pictures. Her reluctance was apparent she wasn't forthcoming with her lawyer either. They excused us from the room, and while I didn't catch every word, it was clear that her lawyer was not entirely satisfied when we returned. When we came back, I received a more truthful account. The two men were recent online hookups. She had been having an affair with one of my co-workers, a person she had referred to as FT, for nearly the entire duration of our relationship. She claimed that she broke things off with him sometime after I proposed, though I remained skeptical. I asked her if she had ever been faithful during our marriage, and she confessed that she had started seeing FT's husband, Amber, on July 4th of 2019. We experienced a fourth barbecue, and during that time, she gave him oral sex while I was present at my house. Later, she openly stated that she did not love him. It was just something that excited her. Throughout the year, her behavior became bolder as she began to engage with random guys she met on dating sites. I had a strong suspicion that she was involved in secret encounters in parking lots and similar places, but I chose not to dig deeper into that specific matter. After consulting with our attorneys, I requested some privacy to ask her some personal questions, and they agreed to step out for a moment. When we were alone, I confronted her about her infidelity, questioning why she cheated on me, why she ever married me, and why she didn't simply say no to all of this. In response, she said she loved me, which seemed like a cruel way of showing it. She expressed a desire for marriage and the security that came with it. She told me I was good in bed, but her heart lingered on someone else, a man she had loved for 10 years, who was not going to leave his wife. She admitted that her biological clock was ticking, and to her, I represented a means to an end, a meal ticket, if you will. She claimed I made her happy, yet she still sought out what she truly wanted. For those curious, both of them lost their jobs due to their actions. Amber caused a scene at work, but I didn't feel the need to make a fuss about anything. My soon-to-be ex-wife is now living with her parents, and I have no idea what the other man and his wife are doing, as I have been told it is not my concern. I suspect he is attempting to stay married, and if he continues down that path, I might have to confront him physically.
When I asked her if there was anything else I needed to know, she dropped a bombshell. She had an abortion two years prior because she didn't know who the father was. That was an emotional blow I wasn't prepared for. At the beginning of our relationship, we had discussed wanting children, but we eventually agreed to stop trying and just enjoy our time together. I would have loved to have another child, especially a daughter I could spoil. We engaged in unprotected sex almost daily, so there was a significant chance the child could have been mine, but I would never find out now. At that moment, the weight of the situation became too much for me. The feeling can be likened to a boxing match where, after taking several blows, you start to go numb. You realize you have taken damage, but the initial pain fades away, and all you're left with is a sense of detachment. That's where I found myself. There was a point where I felt completely indifferent to any further revelations she might share. At this moment, she could tell me she started a major fire in Chicago, and it wouldn't surprise me at all. I called my attorney back and instructed mine to proceed with Plan B. This new plan meant I would no longer demand alimony. Instead, I wanted an uncontested divorce agreement signed as quickly as possible. I laid down a condition for any possible reconciliation. She needed to cut ties with all those other men, a condition I knew was impossible to fulfill. However, it felt unnecessary to be clever about it. The reality was clear. The news of her abortion had shaken me deeply. I did not want to have any reminders of her in my life, not even in the form of a monthly alimony check. At 5.43 p.m., she signed the documents. In about two months, the divorce would be finalized. I would keep my house, my retirement funds, and all my property, with no alimony owed by either of us. She would receive $73,000 from our savings, and she was to have no contact with me ever again. Once the papers were signed, I decided I no longer cared about her future or well-being. I hoped she sought therapy for herself, but was finished with any concern for her life. Despite the resolution, I did not feel relief. It felt more like I had consumed a bitter meal. I was still navigating through a haze of sorrow and confusion after three months of unhappiness. The thought of her abortion weighed heavily on my mind. I was convinced it would linger there for a long time. I had no clear plans for either the immediate future or the long term. I hoped that once everything was settled, I might feel a sense of release, but I couldn't be sure. For now, I simply wanted solitude without sympathetic comments or advice. I needed peace more than anything else. This entire ordeal left me reflecting on my life choices, and I struggled to find moments where I had succeeded or done right by anyone. Instead, it felt like I only focused on my mistakes. I recognized this mindset wasn't healthy, but that was the perspective I was left with. At least I would retain my possessions this time, but I knew I would not put myself in this situation again. In an update, I mentioned a somewhat trivial struggle. I wanted tips on how to remove a ring from my finger. Being a guitarist, keeping all my fingers intact was important to me, yet I had been wearing this ring for six years. I had tried various methods, but nothing seemed to work. I have experimented with a variety of substances in an attempt to ease the discomfort of removing this thing I've been dealing with. I've used olive oil, Crisco, butter, hot water, motor oil, and even WD-40. The frustration is mounting, and I am starting to consider using actual tools for assistance. I no longer want to wear this item. I want to have 10 functional fingers when I finally get it off. The divorce isn't finalized yet, and the emptiness of the house is beginning to weigh heavily on me. In an effort to find comfort, I made the decision to bring a new little companion into my life. I welcomed the cutest little Latina dog into my home. She stands about 8 inches tall and weighs only 5 pounds, and her underbite just adds to her charm. I find myself torn between naming her Maggie or something playful like high fructose corn syrup, because she is just that sweet. I adopted her from the pound. She's a one-year-old chihuahua who simply needed someone who would be happy to see her when they come home. Today, I received the decree for my divorce in the mail. Strangely enough, I find myself feeling neither happy nor sad about it. A few friends suggested we celebrate this milestone, but I don't subscribe to the notion that failure is something to celebrate. In fact, I feel rather numb to it all at the moment. I suspect that the reality of my situation will hit me at an unexpected time later down the line. To complicate matters, she called me today. I answered, 
figuring that discussing things would be the next logical step since everything is already set in motion. During our conversation, it became clear that she has made more mistakes than I have. Rather than offering an apology, she questioned what good that would do. Honestly, I have no idea if she truly feels regret for her actions, but at this point, it hardly matters. The situation with her family is challenging. My son is as close to having a grandchild as they will ever get, and he has asked me if it's alright to reach out to them. I don't have any objections to that, but I wonder how to communicate with them while avoiding any mention of her. It feels like they have caused so much destruction in my life. I once truly cared for her, and it's difficult because they are the only relatives from my side of the family my son may ever have. On a happier note, I have decided to name my little chihuahua Dulce, thanks to a suggestion from someone. The name flows off the tongue nicely. During a recent snowstorm that knocked out power and heat for five days, she kept me warm and cozy, demonstrating her resilience and warmth. I've been contemplating taking a long break from dating or engaging in anything casual until I feel ready again. There's a persistent voice in the back of my mind that tells me she doesn't love me, that she will leave me, and that I'll be left broken. This voice is louder now than ever. For now, I am managing these feelings, but I know it's healthy to acknowledge the fear I feel, like the caution one takes around a hot stove. I recognize that I need ample time to process everything and I am committed to giving myself that time while wishing everyone the best. Just because we may feel beaten down doesn't mean we are not worthy. It's important to stay strong and support each other. As an update, I started therapy back in July. I have been working through a lot of complex feelings and issues in those sessions. The latest round of discussions has revolved around my desire to reconcile with my sister, who is the last remaining family member I have left. I frequently question whether I have the courage to reach out to her after holding a grudge for such a long time. I want my son to get to know family members who share his blood, not just friends he calls aunt and uncle. The estrangement I've experienced has cost me a lot. I want to reclaim some of that lost connection, and if she is willing to speak with me, I am ready to have that conversation. I believe my cousin could help facilitate this process. Although I usually recommend cutting ties with those who don't support you, this is a different situation. Nearly three decades have passed since I last saw my sister. With both my parents and brother gone, she is all that I have left. My therapist is supportive of this potential reconciliation, which provides me with some encouragement. I just need to find the courage to make that first move, to extend an olive branch. I don't want to hold on to a grudge forever. While I firmly believe I made the right decision to cut ties with my family in the past, I no longer wish to live with that feeling. I have custody of my son for the foreseeable future, and I would love to provide him with some semblance of normalcy in his life. Interestingly, I don't miss my ex or my first ex, but I do find myself missing my sister. I've allowed my first wife to dictate my relationships for far too long, and at times I feel as if I am haunted by the past. I truly believe that rebuilding some of those connections could lead to positive change. I'm not hung up on my exes, but I am stuck in my past. For those who might be curious, I have no idea how my ex is doing. I don't communicate with her and have no interest in her life. Amber has been completely eliminated from my world, leaving behind only a bitter reminder of the past. I know that my concerns about the others in my past are minimal, and honestly, I only have one ounce of emotion left to give regarding them. Right now, I am choosing to hold on to that feeling rather than share it. It has been exactly one year since I handed over the walking papers to my ex. The day started off on a positive note. I woke up feeling refreshed and in a good mood. After getting ready, I decided to go for a refreshing run to clear my mind and enjoy the morning air. Once I returned, I made breakfast for my son, cooking up something hearty and delicious that I knew he would enjoy. Following our meal together, I headed off to work, feeling optimistic about the day ahead. Everything was going smoothly at the office, and mentally, I was in a good place. No stress or worries bothering me. However, at around 10.30 a.m., I received a call asking me to come up to the office. When I got there, I found out that there was a delivery of cookies waiting for me, sent by my ex. This had become a yearly tradition for her, a way to remind me of her presence even after we had separated. Feeling slightly annoyed, I informed my co-workers that they were welcome to enjoy the cookies since I didn't want to keep them to myself. 
One of our customer service representatives asked who the cookies were from, and I replied that no one had touched them yet. I was somewhat irritated that someone had shared my workplace details with her, but I tried not to let it ruin my day. Despite that small annoyance, I managed to maintain a fairly decent mood. My ex had her other ways of poking at me, which often included financial struggles. In fact, one of her favorite tactics was to fall behind on her car payments, leading the finance company to call me. I guess that was just another way she was trying to get to me, but I chose not to dwell on it. Later in the day, I returned home and was unexpectedly greeted with a surprise party organized by my friends. They had set up a lovely barbecue complete with some cold beers, creating a warm and festive atmosphere. I felt truly grateful for their efforts. They knew that I might appreciate a little pick-me-up and believed this celebration could brighten my spirits. Honestly, aside from the earlier cookie incident, my day had been pretty good. The surprise party turned out to be a fantastic way to wrap up the day, and I felt surrounded by love and support.